Hello, my name is Christine Cray and I teach at Rochester Institute of Technology. In this presentation, you will not see me, but I will talk over slide illustrations. The title of this talk is The Life of the River at Empire's Edge, Currents, Torrents, Disability, History. The theme of this conference is Unsettling Landscapes, and we are prompted to consider, quote, past, present, and future unsettlings of the world as if settled were normal and unsettled abnormal. However, my research on British colonialism in Belize points to the doggedness of destabilization created by the riverine landscape. Rivers and streams, as can be seen in this photo, were agents with powers of magnetism, energy, and force. Rivers and streams were the means by which people oriented themselves in space, the primary channel of long-distance transportation, a focal point for nearly all productive and commercial activity, the locus and focus of local, regional, and international disputes, and symbols and indices of both danger and freedom. This photo is of a Belizean mangrove swamp. One wonders if the normalization of settlement landscapes, and stasis within anthropology reflect agricultural and settler colonial underpinnings. Standard terms in our discipline imply stasis, the field, culture, and providing a snapshot. In contrast, tracing currents and surges call for methodological strategies of weighing anchor, floating, meandering, hoisting sails, riding waves, tacking, and veering. I have adopted a narrative style that tries to capture these currents and torrents mimetically. I end this talk with thoughts about how archival research and storytelling are fruitful streams for an anthropology that wants to reduce barriers and transform disability into ability. In this work, I have been inspired by Tim Ingold's Being Alive, which considers how humans other living beings, and elements of the natural world are enmeshed. We do not exist in isolation, but we affect one another mutually as we are all in the process of becoming. This drawing from Ingold's book illustrates his ideas of enmeshment and becoming. Ingold's view does not represent environmental determinism, but we are all moving and growing simultaneously with and against one another. Elements of the natural world have power, assets, energy, and they create risks and rewards. Now let's dive into our example, the life of the river. This photo is of a Belizean mangrove swamp. In the 19th century, the British claimed what is now Belize as the colony of British Honduras. It was a region reigned by water, bordering on the Caribbean Sea with low average elevation and a hot tropical climate a tangle of rivers, streams, lagoons, and mangrove swamps carved out pockets of Cahoon ridges and thick hardwood forests. The extensive system of waterways is sustained by heavy rainfall throughout the year, heaviest in the rainy season of summer and fall, as shown in this bar graph. Those conditions hinder overland navigation, and the early Spanish colonizers discovered that paths for horses and mules would be quickly overgrown by vegetation and washed out by rains, and wagons would sink in the mud, especially during the rainy season. This photograph is of a large tractor trapped in mud during the summer rainy season. In the 18th century, one road to Bacalar became known as Horse Bones for its notoriously perilous mud traps. Consequently, all the way through the early 20th century, nearly all long-distance transportation was conducted by water, as shown in this photograph, specifically pit pan canoe, which can navigate even the shallowest of streams. Rivers represented wealth. European colonizers, First Spaniards and then the British followed the waterways in their search for riches, which they would then transport back along those waterways to ports and out to overseas markets. The first commodity exploited was logwood, shown here, which, when split, yields rich red and purple dyes. As red and purple were the colors of royalty and nobility, logwood trees were a coveted prize. 
purple yarn made from logwood dye is shown here. Logwood grows in thick stands right along the water, as can be seen in this photo. The base of the tree is the portion from which the dye is extracted, and the trunks would be cut into small logs, bundled on a person's back, and transported via the small canoes. Notice that I haven't said anything thus far about towns, because in the 18th century, they were almost an afterthought. The woodcutters, including the British and enslaved people of African, indigenous, and mixed descent, did not live in permanent settlements but made temporary camps, building small huts or sleeping in hammocks extended between trees. This slide shows the Belizean flag and coat of arms, which includes two woodcutters, one African and one indigenous. The British woodcutters laid temporary claims to stretches of riverbanks called works. From their hut along the water's edge, the work would extend outward in both directions. The rivers represented progress, not settled towns. When semi-permanent settlements were established, they were associated with women, children, and subsistence food cultivation, not progress. Incessant warring with Spain was occasionally interrupted by treaties and times of peace. In a series of treaties in 1763, 1783, and 1786, Spain allocated a portion of its lands in Central America to Great Britain for timber harvesting. The limits of the timber harvesting region were defined by rivers, streams, and lagoons, as is shown on this map that accompanied the 1786 treaty. Rivering boundaries made sense because, in the absence of regular surveyors, waterways were the most reliable location markers. The waterways were not only useful points for orientation, but they were in fact how people were oriented. Nearly all British productive activity, commercial and otherwise, was done in relation to the waterways. The initial 1763 permitted extraction of logwood, but even at that time what British woodcutters most desired was mahogany, a dense, rot-resistant hardwood with a glorious sheen, as can be seen in this photo of antique mahogany furniture. Those qualities made it the preferred wood for luxury furniture in Europe and North America from the 18th to the early 20th century. This engraving shows two African-descended woodcutters at work. Because mahogany grows very differently than logwood, the mahogany boom of the 18th century changed how woodcutters related to the land, but they remained steadfastly oriented to the riverways. Mahogany prefers drier soils, and so it grows inland rather than on the water's edge. The trees are enormous, each tree producing up to four tons of wood. For perspective, this photo shows a tall mahogany tree, at the base of which one can scarcely make out a man wearing a white shirt. These trees, however, grow at a very low density, one tree per 2.5 square acres. They are also very slow growing, and once cut, it would take more than 30 years for a new tree to reach a harvestable size. Since they are so dispersed and slow growing, woodcutters would have to move further and further upstream to find new trees. This drove the woodcutters to move deeper into the forests, where the indigenous people had built settlements that were intentionally hidden away from European invaders. Once a tree was cut, a road had to be cleared to transport the enormous logs to the banks along the edge of the river where they would be lashed into rafts, as shown here, and floated downstream to the ports and out to sea. Rivers remained the arteries of the British colony. Very little commercial activity took place outside of what was transported by water. Rivers were political. Rivers were a primary, even the primary, political concern for British officials in the 19th century. After Mexico gained independence from Spain, Britain saw the opportunity to possibly claim sovereignty over the timber harvesting region and transform it into a fixed colony. If the treaties with Spain no longer pertained in the post-independence period, border negotiations with Mexico presumably would start with the limits as defined by those prior treaties. 
since the treaties with Spain had established waterways as the borders of the British timber harvesting region, of critical importance was which one of a river's multiple tributaries would represent the source of the river and therefore the true boundary. This map from the mid-19th century illustrates British aspirational borders at the time. The river shaded in pink is the Ando River, which was the treaty-defined northern limit of the British timber harvesting region. The circle shows the three westernmost tributaries of the Ando. If the northernmost tributary, the Blue Creek, were the true source of the river, that would put more land within the British sphere. In 1837, Superintendent MacDonald set out on a three-day exploratory canoe trip up the Ando to observe the volume of water that flowed through its tributaries, and conveniently, he declared the Blue Creek to be the true source. How distressing it was for a subsequent lieutenant governor to learn that, in fact, more water flowed through the southernmost tributary, Booth's River, a discovery that the British did not disclose to Mexico. Rivers were dangerous. Rivers were a powerful current in British relations with the indigenous Maya. In 1847, peasants in eastern Yucatan, primarily of Maya descent, initiated a social war uprising against Yucatecan elites, more commonly known as the Caste War, which stretched out a half century until 1901. Throughout the war, represented in this mural, British Honduran traders were the primary source of guns, gunpowder, and lead for the rebels, and these munitions were transported along the waterways. By 1853, one very large group of Western Maya brokered a peace treaty with the Yucatecan government and thereafter became known as the Pacificos. The treaty committed the Pacificos to join in the fight against the Eastern rebels, and these two Maya groups were then pitted against one another. The munitions that the British Honduran traders ferried upriver, therefore, were also used in attacks by rebels, shown here against the Pacificos, who came to deeply resent the British Honduran traders as well as British officials who, through inaction and ineptitude, allowed the munitions sales to continue. Both Maya groups began to charge the British Honduran timber crews for rent on lands they used, in part because those funds would support their defense. Since the headquarters for the British logging crews were, naturally, along the riverbanks, when rent payments were not made, retaliatory Maya attacks took place at those riverbank locations. West India regimental soldiers, shown in this painting, were then sent in boats upriver to retaliate against the Maya and protect the loggers. Rivers Promised Refuge Rivers also represented refuge for two overlapping groups of people, indebted servants, as in this photo, and deserters. Throughout the 19th century, on both sides of the Ondo River, in Yucatan and British Honduras, employers used the tactics of monopolization of land, wage advances, and the company store to ensnare workers in debt servitude. If peasants didn't have access to land, they would agree to work for an employer in woodcutting or agriculture for a period of time and accept an advance on their wages paid in cash and kind with the value of the goods provided set at marked up prices. Wages earned would be spent at the employer's store, again at marked up prices, to such an extent that the worker remained trapped in debt servitude. Flight was the only way out of this trap, but there were few truly safe spaces because of the monopolization of land. The best option was to flee across the river, with the hope that those on the opposite side, likely antagonists of your employer, would not permit your employer to cross to capture you. Similarly, those who had been pressed into military service, whether into the Yucatecan army or one of the two Maya military groups, such as can be seen in this photo, could most successfully desert and avoid recapture if they crossed to the other side. Consequently, by the 1860s, a distinctive pattern was established along the Ando River. 
peasants would farm on the northern side of the river on lands claimed by one Maya military group or the other, and they were treated like, and sometimes called, vassals. They were obliged to pay rent and also participate in military campaigns when called upon. They hoped to avoid debt servitude in British Honduras by farming to the north of the river and then to escape rent and forced military service if they lived to the south of it. However, Maya military leaders would cross the river to forcibly collect rent and recapture deserters and absconded debtors, actions that British officials considered invasions of their territory. These combined riverine aggravations ultimately transformed the British colony. New administrative districts were created, a frontier police force was created, and military fortifications built, all oriented to the river. In many ways, therefore, in 19th century British Honduras, what powered everything kept everything electrified and charged in the form of wealth, political negotiations, flight, and armed conflict with the currents and torrents of the rivers. This is an aerial photo of the Belize River. As Faye Ginsberg and Raina Rapp have written in Disability Worlds, disability is a social condition. It is not a fixed characteristic of a person, but it is an effect of the lack of support and inclusion that would otherwise allow a person to participate fully in social life. Just as rivers flow, turn around bends, and as the stories of our lives play out, we anthropologists may or may not be able to carry out the characteristically quintessential type of fieldwork, international, face-to-face, and immersive. We are no less anthropologists because of it, though. As for me, that type of fieldwork and attending conferences in person are less and less viable as I care for my autistic child. An anthropology that is committed to equity and inclusion should be fully open to creative types of research carried out by people who are making adjustments to life with disability. In my case, I have shifted to archival research, which can be conducted with short trips to archives, taking thousands of digital photographs of documents, such as this one, to be analyzed back at home. Although this was my second choice in research strategies, it is not second best. Taking the long view in archival research and reading documents penned by individuals enabled me to see that, across centuries, rivers and streams steered production, commerce, migration and settlement, labor relations, war, claims to colonial sovereignty, and geopolitical competition. I saw that riverscapes edged out landscapes and that, consequently, destabilization rather than stasis was the norm. I also realized that only a mimetic narrative style could properly illustrate those currents and eddies. Consequently, adapted methods yielded innovations in content and style. Let's see what other insights of content and innovations of method and representation emerge as we I hope, collectively fashion a fully accessible anthropology. Thank you very much for your time.